Welcome to Innovations in Education. I'm your host, David Adams, CEO of the Urban Assembly. And on this show, we bring guests every single episode who have made things work in public education. This show is about the innovators. This show is about the folks who are solving problems. This show is about making things work in education. Now, there's a lot of shows out there talking about what's wrong in the education systems, and those are great shows. There's some shows talking about what we're not doing well, and there's a lot to learn from those, but that's not this show. This show is going to be featuring educators who are making things work for young people and improving public education. Today, I'm joined by John B. King Jr. John King is an American educator, a civil servant, and a former state and federal official who was the 15th chancellor of the State University of New York, otherwise known as SUNY. John, you served previously as the president and CEO of the Education Trust, a national civil rights nonprofit, which seeks to identify and close opportunities and achievement gaps for students from preschool through college. And as we all know, you served as the 10th United States Secretary of Education from January 1st, 2016 to January 20th, 2017 under President Barack Obama. And immediately before you assumed that leadership, you were the acting deputy secretary from 2015, 2016. You were also the New York State Education Commissioner from 2011 to 2014. And as we just mentioned, you've been appointed to the chancellor of the State University of New York on December 5th, 2022. We're very excited to have you on our show. Welcome, John. Grateful for the opportunity to join you. So John, we're really excited to have you on. I just want to mention here that I was at a family barbecue for July 4th, and folks were asking, when the next episode of Innovations in Education we're going to drop? And I told my folks who are interested in this podcast that I had a really special guest coming on. It'll be worth the wait, and that special guest was you. So I'm really excited to have you on. Really excited to have you think about what Innovations in Education looks like, and really excited to have you think about your long history in New York. So... I went through your bio a little bit, and you do have this long history in New York and education. You actually started as a student here in New York, and then you went on to lead the entire system. So given that history, what are some memorable experiences that you've had that helped shape your leadership today? David, again, thanks for the opportunity to be a part of this podcast. You know, my journey in education in New York really begins with my childhood. You know, I grew up in Brooklyn. Both my parents were career New York City public school educators. My dad was a teacher, principal. My mom was a teacher and school counselor. And they both spent their whole careers in the New York City public schools. But they both passed away when I was little. My mom when I was eight and my dad when I was 12. And in the period when it was just my dad and me, my dad was struggling with Alzheimer's. Home was incredibly difficult, unstable, scary a lot of the time. Mm -hmm. And the thing that saved me was school. I had just a series of amazing teachers at PS 276 in Canarsie and Mark Twain Junior High School in Coney Island who saved my life, who made school a place that was safe, supportive, compelling, engaging, nurturing. And because of those educators, I was able to survive that period. And, you know, after my dad, Pass. I moved around different family members, different schools, but it was always teachers who gave me a sense of hope and purpose. And so really what's driven my whole career has been a desire to try to do for other kids what educators did for me. Mm -hmm. It feels like this idea of school as community, school as an extension of things that we are, don't always have in, in, in various backgrounds was something that really elevated your passion and your purpose in terms of how you oriented your mission as an educator. Absolutely. You know, I'm still in touch with my teacher from fourth, fifth, sixth grade, Mr. Osterweil. You know, he created in our classroom this profound sense of community and also exposed us to a whole world beyond Canarsie, Brooklyn. You know, it was academic experiences like reading the New York Times every day, doing a production of A Midsummer Night's Dream, Shakespeare yeah. Elementary School, but it was also going to the Museum of Natural History, going to the ballet, yeah. uh, having all of these experiences that introduced us to ideas, concepts, art forms that we otherwise wouldn't have been exposed to and really made New York City our mm -hmm. classroom. 
in a sense. So yeah, it's that nurturing set of relationships, but also that sense of participation in a broader community. When you mentioned that participation, it resonates with me because I uh, recently wrote an article talking about what schools teach us about our place in society. And I think when we go back to Brown versus Board of Education, the justices didn't talk about racism and discrimination as lower investment in schools per se, or segregation. It, it wasn't necessarily about one per people spending being 10 and the other per people spending being five. It was about what segregation taught us about our place in society as Black people. And as I hear you talk about your teachers and, and the folks who brought you in, it's about like, what was your place in society vis-a-vis -vis some of these institutions like the Museum of Natural History, some of our birthrights in terms of, as citizens of New York, what we are entitled to, but also what folks have prepared for us, who we are part of and that sense of community. Yeah, I think that's right. I mean, in many ways, school sends a signal to kids about how they are seen and valued. You know, there's a footnote in the Brown opinion, which I used to teach about when I taught high school history, footnote 11, which cites the Kenneth Clark doll study. Yeah. Where, you know, Black students were internalizing a negative sense of self because of school segregation, because of the message that Black kids were somehow less. Yeah. And, you know, the court in Brown is really trying to say that is in tension with the promise of the 14th Amendment and the idea of equal protection of the laws. Yeah. And, you know, I worry when you think about last week's Supreme Court decision, you know, upending decades of precedent around affirmative action. You now have a court signaling, in a way, the opposite message of the Brown message. Rather than saying to Black and Latino students, we see you, we care about you, we want you here. You have the court sending a more hostile message. And, you know, I think that's what Justice Sotomayor and Justice Township Brown Jackson talked about, in their opinion, the danger of the majority opinion ending affirmative action, undermining the progress we've made in trying to say that our democracy is truly inclusive. If you say that, John, I mean, I have always been invested in the nature and the purpose of public schooling. Like one of the questions I ask myself is, out of all the innovations of the United States, the airplane was invented, right, in the United States. I think what folks are not always tracking is public schools were an American innovation. And, and I always try to ask myself why. Like, wh what is it about America? What is it about the problems that we were trying to solve and, and however those imperfect those solutions were that generated this system of publicly funded schools? And to what end? And I think there is a, an important emphasis on ensuring, for example, that we can all participate in democracy, that we can all participate in self-governance. And also there's this implicit kind of goal of saying, we will build a sense of community through this common good that we are all contributing to that impacts our young people. And so if, if I may, you know, I think there's this push these days that say, don't bring politics into schools, leave the politics elsewhere and, and, and save the schools for schooling. But I think our history would tell us that politics and schools are like peanut butter and jelly, right? Everything from the Scopes monkey trial and evolution to Brown versus Board, right? Which was that Plessy versus Ferguson overturned that precedent. Most of the things that were really transformational, or even when we're thinking about reconstruction in the South with the Union Army, right? Schools were the linchpin of how we reshaped an identity. So I just, I wanted to raise this with you and think about this notion of politics in schools, the purpose of public schools, and then we'll get to your vision as chancellor. Give me your sense of that, if you would. Oh, look, I think you're exactly right. Public education is foundational to the health of our democracy. Public schools are a way in which we equip the next generation with skills, but they're also a way in which we communicate what's valued yeah. what we prioritize as a society. And, 
you know, to me, that then puts an obligation on all of us as educators to be very thoughtful about how we organize schools, the messages we send, the books we read, the choices we make instructionally. If students see diverse characters in books, they take away one message about themselves and our society. And if they don't see those diverse characters, if they don't read diverse authors, they take away a very different message. And, you know, I think it's very dangerous that we have folks now who are advocating for book bans, who are trying to erase the hard parts of our history, trying to say there's something wrong with teaching the truth of slavery or the horrible acts committed against indigenous peoples or the really imprisonment of Japanese Americans during World War II. If we erase those things, if we don't tell the truth, then we undermine young people's ability to participate fully in our democracy. So the stakes are very high for all the reasons you described. I'm very resonant with that. It's not the most popular view, but I say, let them come, right? We, we should have a, a debate about values in schools. We should have folks on school boards saying, I believe X and other folks saying, I think Y is important. Schools really are a reflection of not just the instructional content, one plus one is two, but the notion of what it means to be in community, what it means to be American, what it means to be a New Yorker. And while I think those debates and conversations are important in terms of the civility and the constructive discourse, I think sometimes we forget that there are competing notions of values. And when we think about we the people, one of the things, John, I think you and I talked about is who was the we and the we the people when that constitution was written? And we have a history of including more and more folks in that we. And more and more folks, as you were saying, getting signals from our society that they are part of the fabric of America. And I think if we can get into these conversations in these local levels and say, the reason why this is important is because we want the we, the people, to be the we in our community. Mm -hmm. and, and, and there are a lot of different folks in our community, and we want this public institution to really be a place where each of those folks can get a sense of themselves and others and how we would negotiate that on the, you know, religious holidays, right? The, the tactical parts are, are really quite complex. You know, mm -hmm. I think you can say mm -hmm. it really easily, but actually I, I think it's a healthy thing to say and to have people say, I feel like our public schools should be X. You know, we talk about parent rights. Should parents have an important role to play in public schools? They absolutely should. But as we know, Parents are not the only people who contribute to the public school space, right? There are many folks who don't have children or whose children have grown up who still, through their taxes, support the public school system. And so it really is not just about one group. It's about all of these groups coming together, to my sense, to think about what the future of America should be through our schools. Mm -hmm. that, that's exactly right. And I think, you know, one wonderful thing about New York has been generations of commitment to investment in public education's foundational role and the idea that public education is for everyone. That's right. So at SUNY, at the State University of New York, we have 64 campuses in every corner of the state. More than 95% of New Yorkers are within 30 miles of a SUNY campus. Mm. And we truly have a place for everyone at SUNY, whether that's at one of our community colleges, one of our comprehensive colleges, our four-year institutions, at one of our university centers, you know, which are major national centers of research, in one of our graduate programs, in our workforce development programs, you know, quite literally, whether you need to improve skills in an area at work so you can move up at your job, or you want a PhD in engineering, we've got it all across the SUNY system. And the state has maintained an investment in making sure those are excellent opportunities and that they're affordable yeah. for folks. Yeah. 
Well, let's talk a little bit more about your vision as, as a chancellor of the SUNY system. What are the priorities that you are pushing forth? And what are some of the strategies that you have to achieve those on behalf of our students here in New York and beyond? Yeah, yeah. So as I came to the system, I started in January. One of the first things I did was to visit all 64 campuses. It's an opportunity to learn and listen. It's a lot bigger state than we thought it was, right? Yeah, that's right. right. Just sit with faculty, staff, students, employer and community partners, and just hear about the strengths and also some of the challenges. And with our board of trustees, I really laid out, I think, four pillars that will be foundational to our long-term health as a community of institutions. One is student success. And that is making sure every New York student knows there's a place for them at SUNY and making sure that the students who start finish with a meaningful degree or credential. You know, everybody comes to school with a goal. We've got to help them to achieve that that goal. And so we're very focused on scaling evidence-based practices that help ensure that students complete. And in particular, making sure that we close equity gaps for low-income students, students of color, so forth, and completion. So student success is one. Second is research and scholarship. You know, higher education has a vital role to play in solving the biggest challenges we face as a society. You know, you think about climate change and the work we need to do to move to renewable energy, to build resilient systems as climate change occurs. Universities are the answer to that. We're going to do that research at SUNY. You think about the health disparities we have, the racial health disparities we face as a country. The answers to those questions will come through research and scholarship. And so advancing research and scholarship is critical. The governor, Governor Hochul, who's a huge supporter of SUNY, has asked us to double research across the system, and, and that is our goal. The third pillar is diversity, equity, and inclusion. And, you know, this is a diverse state. For 75 years, inclusion has been central to our mission at SUNY. We've got to make sure that our student body, our faculty, our leadership reflect the diversity of the state and that all students develop an appreciation for the value of diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, One of the things we're phasing in now is a general education requirement that every SUNY graduate will have taken a course that grapples with issues of diversity, equity, and inclusion. That might be in a public health course. It might be in a history course. might be a sociology course. might be a communications course. But every student, whether they are getting an associate's degree in a career field or they're getting you know, their, their college degree in, in the humanities, whatever field they're studying, we're going to make sure that they have that exposure to diversity, equity, and inclusion. And then the fourth pillar is economic development and upward mobility. And, yeah. you know, that's very much the SUNY tradition, yeah. helping folks get access to not only excellent education, but a pathway to economic opportunity. I want to think about the term that you used here a little bit earlier when you talked about a degree or a credential. And I know that there's been a move a little bit in higher education towards employability, towards this notion of skills-based hiring credentials that are more flexible than maybe a four-year degree would be. Tell me a little bit more about the relationship between economic mobility and different kinds of credentialing systems that can help our students be successful to and through college. Yeah. Well, look, let's start with the foundational point that folks who have a bachelor's degree are going to earn more than a million dollars more over their lifetime. So it is still true that that bachelor's degree, an undergraduate degree, unlocks a degree of economic opportunity. That said, that may not be the immediate thing that one pursues immediately after completing high school or depending on where you are in your life trajectory, that may not be accessible or fit with your life. And it may make sense to get a certificate or credential that is more tightly tied to a specific job in the economy. You know, we have Micron, the semiconductor company coming to central New York. Between Micron and the supply chain companies, it's going to bring 50,000 plus jobs to that 
greater Syracuse region. Some of those jobs in the semiconductor industry will go to technicians who have a one-year certificate. They won't have an associate's degree or a bachelor's degree, just that one-year training that's tightly bound to the skills that are necessary for that job at Micron. That said, we think it's important at SUNY to make sure that credentials are stackable. Right. I may start with that one year credentialing program, but then I know I can come back and get my associate's degree. I can come back later and get that bachelor's degree. And maybe I do it as I move up in the workplace. Mm -hmm. So I am doing that part time. We have to create those options, that flexibility for people. But at the end of the day, students are coming to educational institutions because they want to be equipped with skills that are going to help them support their families and advance economically. Yeah, I'm very resonant with that. I think this notion of stackable credentials, a lifelong learning pathway, the insurance that different credentials from different institutions can talk to each other, have to pay twice for the same piece. Those are things that are resonant. And I think one of the things that we struggle with at the UA to think through is the difference between training and education, for example. As we kind of want to make sure that there are practical skills that our students can display with fluency. We also grapple with the history of racism and discrimination. It's particularly in the concept of vocational and class-based discrimination, uh, vocational technical education. And we have seven great technical education schools at the Urban Assembly. And I always work to think about how do we create a model that both gives students practical skills but doesn't deprive them from what we say as an education. And in the Army, you know, we make a distinction between education and training, right? Education tends to be around problem solving and training tends to be about responses that are consistent and can be displayed under conditions of stress, right? And so I just wanted to get a sense of how you're thinking about the role of higher education in navigating the two things that we're trying to do, educate folks for citizenship, contribute to their society, contribute to their community, and also educate folks for skills that they can work with. Mm -hmm. Look, you know, when people frame that question, you know, are we preparing citizens or are we preparing folks for participation in the economy? My answer is yes, right? We are doing both and we have to do both. Yeah. We want our students to be prepared to show up at that local city council hearing and make the case for what is in the public interest based on their perspective as a citizen. That's a skill we need them to have. We want them to be able to sit with their neighbors and, and sort through challenges facing their neighborhood. At the same time, we also want folks to be prepared to get a good job with decent wages and benefits. It's going to allow them to take care of their families. And we sometimes act like those are intention. I actually think they are, and they are potentially mutually reinforcing because the problem solving skills we envision for the well-prepared citizen will also be helpful in the workplace and the ability to collaborate and cooperate with others in the workplace will actually be helpful to you as a citizen. So, you know, I think we try, our faculty members try to think about both of those dimensions, but look, I don't, I don't want to oversimplify. There's a tension there around how much time we allocate to different activities, what messages we send to students about what's most important. and. Yeah, I think we have to be disciplined about reinforcing the citizenship component and the economic development component have to go hand in hand. And I also, you know, think about as a parent, you want your child also to be prepared to have a fulfilling life, you know, and an appreciation for the arts, for nature. And so there is also a set of experiences about loving, learning, and appreciating the world around them that you also want students to come away with. I, I'm really deeply resonant because I think while, to your point, there is complexity there, by naming the different end states of a high-quality education and then naming the trade-offs 
that we need to work through, I think it gives us a clearer sense of why we are making the decisions that we're making. You know, there is, for example, as you said, an appreciation for human innovation and, and humans' contribution to the world around them as part of what it means to be educated. And I go back to Booker T. Washington and W.B. Du Bois, right, with regards to this more practical, hey, can you do the thing? Can you do the farming? Can you be a self-sufficient economic unit? Coming from Booker T. Washington and W. Du Bois, looking at more, I don't want to say esoteric, but higher levels of training in terms of the mind, are we contributing to the human knowledge set, right? And I tell people that this is not a new argument, <laughs> you know? Yeah. And I, I get a little surprised by folks being so certain that they have the answer, because I think many folks who have worked very hard in our community were very humble in their approach to try and uplift our community and, and work through those tension points. So I uh, mm -hmm. appreciate your sharing. The other thing, John, I think that's really interesting, and I want to elevate to my listeners, is I'm pretty sure out of anybody that I know, you have held every single job possible in the public education space, all the way up to the Department of Education, from schools to state leaders. So what I wanted to do is just get a little back to that space, if I could, and I want you to just reflect on your career. What have you learned? What's changed in the education landscape since you've led in the highest levels. What do you see now as some reflections back and some pathways forward for education in the United States? Mm -hmm. You know, a few things come to mind as, as you frame that question. One is, you know, I still always say, despite having had these very complex jobs, the hardest job I ever had was first year of teaching. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the complexity of learning to be an effective teacher and doing it all for the first time, yeah. the relationship building, the curriculum development, the grading, the stress and anxiety of, uh, did I get this right? When you don't have experience to lean on, that was by far the hardest. You know, I think at the end of the day, education still always comes down to the relationship between teacher and student and the work in which they are engaged. And that is true in K-12, it's true in higher ed. At the end of the day, what we're trying to support is those relationships between faculty and staff and their students and the quality of the work that they're engaged in together, whether that's the classroom discourse or the research that they're engaged in. And unfortunately, in the politics and the kind of system level needs sometimes distract us from that core mm -hmm. which, and comes down to that relationship and the substance of the work. And if we can put the focus back there, mm -hmm. I think we can better serve our institutions. The other thing I'd say is I've been very lucky that I've had great mentors and teachers throughout my life and my career. Yeah. And I've tried in my career to pay that forward. And as people think about their career trajectories, I hope everyone, you know, is listening to the podcast is thinking about who am I mentoring right now? Who am I lifting up right now? Uh, how am I paying forward the guidance that I've received? When you say that, one of the things that really sits with me is the naming of the role that we play. So the 10th Education Secretary of the United States, the 15th Chancellor of SUNY, I just, it reminds us, I think, when we are able to recognize that there will be an 11th, there has been an 11th, mm -hmm. there will be a 16th. And so like our legacies are really wrapped up in our ability to contribute to the next generation, the next uh -huh. version uh -huh. of, of what we do, the roles, you know? 100%. President Obama would talk about it as passing the baton, mm -hmm. that you, you run your part of the race as well as you can, and then you pass the baton. Mm -hmm. And the things we're trying to achieve, building a healthier democracy, closing equity gaps, rectifying injustices that have been with us in some cases since before the country's founding. That is not work done in one school year or one 
leadership position or one career or one lifetime. That is the work of generations. And so we really do have to be prepared to pass that baton and thoughtful about how we set up the next person for success. One of the things that we talk about in terms of an educated person at the Urban Assembly is educated person is able to improve the systems around them and navigate the common good while doing so. Mm -hmm. And I remember having to put navigate the common good because <laughs> it was important for me to note that improving systems should benefit the most people possible. That notion of how we set up ourselves for regenerating our society and improving it as a kind of obligation. You know, you, you said people, they invested in you, they poured into you. And, and so we have an obligation to do well by those who are coming after us. That's right. And we have to do that work in whatever seat we are in with whatever tools that we have. You know, I think about when I was secretary, one of the things I was privileged to work on was a pilot program we launched to allow 65 colleges and universities around the country to use Pell Grants, the federal higher education funding for folks who are incarcerated. Mm -hmm. The idea was to try to demonstrate the power of higher education in prison mm -hmm. and in a way try to rank the wrong that in the 94 crime bill, Pell Grants were banned for right. folks who are incarcerated. Right. So we started that pilot project when I left the administration, went to the Ed Trust, you know, now I'm on the outside, but we try to Ed Trust to partner with other civil rights groups, criminal justice reform organizations on the left and right, education advocates to say, we, we need to grow this pilot and we should change the law. And so mm -hmm. I was doing it on the outside. And now at SUNY, I have the privilege of supporting those programs across our campuses. We're the largest provider of higher education in prison. Just a couple of weeks ago, I was at graduation ceremony at the Shawanga Correctional Facility, 33 graduates from SUNY Ulster. Mm -hmm. uh, and that was incredibly gratifying and inspiring to see folks who so want education against all odds, completing that education, the difference it'll make in their lives. Yeah. And it's so nice to be able to just, you know, keep working on this issue, you know, keep advocating and supporting and trying to make a difference on this issue. It's this balance, I think, between urgency and humility, right? Mm -hmm. like, mm -hmm. Urgency of like, we got to get things done. We got to make it work always forward. And then the humility of, I am uh, a part of the American story of the New York story of a story of improving public education. And I'm going to do my part, right? And I think that's that kind of, as leaders, I think we always struggle with this kind of urgency and humility. You don't burn out if you don't recognize that you have a part to play and, and you need to pass it off. You got to get up every day and make it work. And to your point, I read today in the New York Times, there was a, a story about the role Pell Grants have played for prisoners, the role of just making sure that they have work access to higher education, again, to signal that they are being returned to a, a place in society that they can start to contribute rather than take. Yeah, 100%. And, you know, many of the folks who are incarcerated are parents. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and I remember visiting one of the programs at Sing Sing and talking with a student who's incarcerated who said, you know, because he was pursuing higher education while incarcerated, it was the first time, as he put it, he had moral credibility with his family. Mm -hmm. And he talked about being able to say to his kids, here's why you need to work hard in school. Here's why you need to focus on your studies. Based on being able to talk about his own experience, doing his school work while pursuing higher education while at Sing Sing. And, and that was really powerful to me. It's, you know, it's generational, yeah. the difference that, that these opportunities can make. For our last couple of ideas, I, I want to spend some time on this notion of generations. Uh, 2019, you actually had a meeting with the descendants of those who enslaved your ancestors. And I remember this being a really important, really important meeting. You wrote a couple articles about it. We had talked about it. Tell me a little bit about what that meeting meant to you and the future of America? Yeah. Well, look, it's a very American story. Like most African-Americans I 
I've always known that there was slavery in our family history. But when I was secretary, I was invited to give a commencement address at University of Maryland Eastern Shore, where my grandmother graduated in 1894. Wow. And to prepare for the commencement address, I embarked on this family history research project and worked with a historian who had worked at the Schomburg, part of the New York Public Library that focuses on African-American history. And she was helping me with this project. One night I got an email from her saying, I've located the place where your ancestors were enslaved, Mm -hmm. where your grandfather, and it's still owned to this day by the family or directly descended from the family that enslaved your family. And they've maintained the property just as it was in the 1860s. And the cabin that your great-grandfather lived in as an enslaved person is still standing on the property. Mm. So then for our family, there was this complicated moment of, you know, what do you do? You know, do you, do you call ahead? Do you write a note? Do you send an email? Like, how do you I'm for dinner. This conversation? Yeah. And my cousin... You know, as I, I shared all this information with my family, my cousin happened to be visiting the Smithsonian Museum of African American History and Culture, where there is a cabin that, that was the quarters for enslaved people. And she saw that and she said, you know, I'm just going to go. So she just went to the property, knocked on the door and said, you know, my people, my, my ancestors weren't enslaved here. And that sparked this opportunity to build a relationship with the family to be able to stand inside of that cabin to come to learn about the history of my great-grandfather and his family and the relationship is complicated i mean we are friends and we have this complicated shared history about which they had not spent a lot of time pondering you know right that was a thing that stuck out to me i remember when i read the, the article this monumental time and, and impact in, in, in many of our lives and families. And I remember they were like, oh yeah, we saw that cabin. We, we didn't quite understand what was going on. This, it was this like, I remember that really standing out to me. And then yeah. Yeah. Like, like when they met you, they're like, oh, well, this is a whole thing. Yeah. 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 Look at, you know, they, they called the cab. So the cabin is not 30 feet from the main house. Mm. So you're, you know, when you stand inside, you're very conscious that slavery was this incredibly intimate institution, right? These were two families living in the same physical space, one owning the other. Yeah. And they referred in their family to the structure, to the cabin as the quarters. Mm -hmm. But they were using it for storage, right? There, There wasn't the sense of history around it. But when they met us, to their credit, they really began to grapple with that. They cleaned out the cabin and now see it as preserving a, a piece of history. And so I appreciate the journey they've been willing to go on with us as we learn together. And it's hard. You know, I think for them grappling with the immense sin mm-hmm. of their ancestors is hard. It's hard, it's hard to, to, to reconcile. Yeah. Uh, you know, at one point, it's two sisters are about my age. They said, you know, we hope our, our people weren't cruel to your people. And I knew what they meant in the sense that we hope that, that they, they didn't torture. Yeah. But what I, I said to them about that was that, well, of course they were, because the institution of slavery is a cruel institution. Right. Oh, being owned is torture. Right. And so... You know, but but so we've been working through this journey together. And and John, I think what inspires me so much and why I wanted to bring this up for our listeners is I feel like this very personal working through is what our country needs to think about how we aspire to. You know, there is shame, there is sin, there is this question of the sins of our fathers and, and how we make amends for those things. And to the extent that we as a nation, right, are able to look at these institutions and have these conversations and what you said, friends, and and still not shy away from, mm-hmm. the, these, these, it's complex. 
Mm-hmm. You know, and again, I, I, I'm a little skeptical when folks are like, I got the answer, Dave. The answer is one, two, and three. I'm like, I, I am, I am proud of you. I'm very happy that you are so sure that you know how to do this because I've seen folks really put a lot of effort into these kinds of interactions and relationships and with goodwill and struggle with some of the implications of what it means to be in relationship. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. So. I appreciate that. And I wanted to just elevate that for the folks. So we're coming close to the end of our conversation, John. And, and you know that at the end of every conversation here on innovations in public education, we got to check with our folks to recognize the thing that you're most proud of in terms of your innovation in education and the thing that you want to leave other educators with as they look to solve problems in the public education system. So what is the innovation you're most proud of? And what's one thing we can leave our educators with who look to solve problems? Yeah. You know, it's funny, I've reflected on this question and I don't know that there's a thing, like a program or policy. I've certainly been involved in lots of them, but the thing I'm most proud of is where I feel like I've been able in some small way to contribute to the lives of my students in the way that teachers contributed to mine. Mm -hmm. I think about one of my students who was my student when I was a middle school principal. She is now in the state legislature in Massachusetts, one of the leaders in the state legislature in Massachusetts. And when I visited her on the floor of the Massachusetts State House, African American woman, when they built that, they didn't have any vision. When they built that building, that she could be standing there. That was incredibly inspiring to me. And now she's in the legislature working on education issues. We actually had a chance to write an op-ed together about the need for school funding reform in Massachusetts a couple of years ago. It makes me very proud to think that in some small way, I was able to contribute to her trajectory. And now she's going to make a difference for others. And so that's what I'm proud of. And that's the thing I'd leave folks with is, you know, the great gift of being an educator is your students and having them go on and do great things and make a difference in the world and just finding some fulfillment and knowing that you help along the way. Yeah. Well, we started out with a conversation about the nature of public education. We moved on to some of the things that you were prioritizing as chancellor of SUNY. We talked a little bit about your personal experience in terms of meeting the folks who enslaved your ancestors and what that means for America. And then we came back with inspiration that at the end of the day, the most innovative, the thing that you're most proud of is putting students on a trajectory to continue to improve our society. And for that, I'm I'm deeply grateful for your time. I'm deeply grateful for your service to our country, your service to our community, and your example for every young person who wants to do something in the world and sees education as part of that solution. Well, thank you. Thanks for the opportunity to join you. And thanks for being a phenomenal, reflective educator and educational leader. Really inspired by you. Thank you, John. Thanks for listening to our latest episode of Innovations in Education, where we bring education leaders who have made things work in the education sector. If you like this episode, please subscribe so that you can hear more great content around innovation. I've been your host, David Adams. Have a great day.